right. Thanks, guys. Welcome to Social Circle Mastery. This is a pretty awesome seminar. Me and Mr. M consider this kind of our baby. It's taken us probably a year, year and a half to create this, and it's probably the biggest impact on my life of anything I've ever studied or, or you know, worked on. Um, <clears throat> before we get going, I want to make, make some things clear. What this seminar is not, this is not going to be full of routines, lines. If you want that, go to a boot camp. Okay, we cover that. Get magic bullets, get the routines manual. Uh, if you want to know phone and text game, I'm writing a book on that. Jim and I are working on a book on attraction. Um, so if you're worried about what exactly specifically to say, uh, that's another seminar. All right, this is going to be a seminar on how to build a dynasty, how to build a lifestyle, how to build a life with cool people around you and hot girls around you. Okay, so if you have any, if, any misconceptions, that's in the boot camp. It's a different thing. Okay, um, <clears throat> real quick, my story. Um, what happened to me is well, I've kind of gone full circle. When I first, when I was younger, I, I would say high school, uh, college, I didn't really have a problem meeting girls. I was naturally good at a lot of things I'm going to teach you in this seminar. And, um, but, you know, when I got to college, I remember uh, when I got to college, it was kind of like a fresh start for me. It was kind of a, it shook me out of my reality. I grew up in a really small town, and uh, there I was kind of the cool kid. But when I got to college, it was like fresh start. And it was like nobody cared who you were back then. Um, I had a hard time meeting girls, um, and I didn't even know what cold approach was. I didn't know about game until just a couple years ago. Uh, so what I did was I just went and networked like crazy. Some of the things I'm going to teach you guys in here, and met all the friends I could, set up kind of a little dynasty until I could kind of lean back and let girls come to me like they had before, right? Um, but then after I graduated college, I had, a, I had a girlfriend for probably two or three years. We had a really bad breakup. Um, I got really, really depressed, like catatonic depression. Um, I was about to start law school. All my friends had moved off, and I was like, what am I going to do? Do I have to spend another three years starting over building the social circle? This sucks, right? So then I found the game, read that in like a night. I was like, sweet. Okay, now I can actually go meet girls, don't have to build a big social circle, awesome. So I spent about a year um, studying that stuff and got really good at it. I mean, I, I got better than I ever thought I could be at something like that. Um, but then one thing I noticed through that was the, the, the high quality of girls I was used to dating in, when I had a big social circle was comp really inconsistent. One night I'd go out and I was a hero, next night I'd go out and the six would be like, fuck off. Anybody else go through that? It's completely frustrating, right? Um, so then we spent, you know, Jim and I spent a long time talking about this, and I was like, you know, it's strange. Some of the, the most consistent girls I've ever dated and the hottest girls I've ever dated, you know, with, with consistency, like 10 after 10 after 10, was when I had a massive social circle, right? And the best my cold approach game ever was was when I had a massive social circle. Why? Because when you have a massive social circle, it's just a game again. It's just for fun. It's just a hobby. When you treat it like that, all your subcommunications come in the line, everything goes right. Um, so when we thought about that, I was like, you know, Mr. M, why do we, why do we get into this? What is this all about? What's the end goal here? I have other jobs I could do that would pay me more. You know, I, what are we doing? I was like, I got into this to build a lifestyle, to date the hottest girls on the planet, right? And I was like, let's sit down and deconstruct this and figure out how we did it. And that's where this came from. Okay, uh, Mr. M's story. Uh, <coughs> his is a little different than mine. He came out, he was kind of, he went from uh, zero to hero, kind of, right? Like when he, he didn't, I don't think he got laid until he was like 20, 21. Um, and he learned the cold approach path first. So he, he got insanely good at cold approach. And then after, you know, after doing that for a while, he moved to London and met up with Sheriff and a couple other guys. And they developed, they, they created like a uh, club promotions company. And through that, they, they learned like really high end, how to get in these high end social circles and to, to build like really powerful social circles around them and really maximize your independent value in those situations. Um, and, and since I've met Jim, he's introduced me to so many celebrities and, and models and crazy stuff that he's slowly built into his social circle. All right, so no matter where you're coming from, whether you're coming from my situation where you were cool, kind of had to fall from grace and you had to kind of rise from the ashes, or whether your story is like Mr. M's where you, you know, started from nothing and you had to build it from scratch, this seminar is for you, all right? All right, let's see. Um, <clears throat> we've kind of covered this a little bit, but why would you want to develop a social circle? Uh, you know, you could just, why don't you just learn game and learn all the routines and memorize that so you can go sniper off the hottest girls? Well, honestly, there is no better or worse. Uh, my, my roommate Carlos, uh, the hunter, one of the other instructors, he doesn't do that much social circle game. He just has perfected his craft with cold approach, and he does sleep with and date some of the hottest girls you've ever seen. But um, I usually, I like the analogy of farming versus hunting, right? In cold approach, it's a lot like hunting. 
you go out and sometimes you know you kill the biggest deer in the forest in the forest with the biggest rack right but uh, sometimes you know you're hungry so you have to eat so you take the scrawniest disease ridden runt right it's fucking frustrating isn't it but um with with social circle it's more like farming you can sow your seed you can you can plant your crop let it grow over time and then come back and you've always got food to eat and you can come back and pick the very best crops over time does that make sense one of the other reasons is for your inner game. Mr. M and I teach an inner game seminar, and what we found was from all the books we'd studied and going from you know, Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, psychology, everything else, every one of them came back to the same thing. The best thing for your inner game is a strong social life, having strong social ties, having people that care about you and people you care about, right? Um, and what I noticed was cold approach was killing my inner game. One week I was riding cloud nine, I felt like, king of the world, if, if I slept with three girls or if these girls all responded to me well, then the next week I'd go out and get blown out like crazy and my inner game would just crash. And I'd be like, oh my God, this shit doesn't work. What am I doing? I'm fucked. Holy shit. Should have married that girl. In college, this is all bullshit. These guys just make this stuff up. What am I doing? Um, and one thing I, I like this, it says, uh, we got this from a psychology book. It says, confidence is reinforced by anticipation of social acceptance, right? Confidence is reinforced by the anticipation of social acceptance. Anybody ever feel like, all right, if I have three shots and my five best friends are there, I will own this fucking club. But if you go to there and it's like you and two guys you don't really know, you'll kind of hide in the corner, not say what you really mean, won't be funny, right? That's another reason to build this thing. Um, it bleeds into every other area of your life. Another thing that I love is that it creates warm approaches. This is where social circle and cold approach meld together. If you've ever been out with your friends and when you're really killing it, you guys were just having a great time, you notice that girls suddenly were closer to you and you didn't need some crazy opener and 15 routines, you can just be like, hi, what's your name? Because she'd been cutting her eyes at you all night. Social circle mastery creates warm approaches. Um, okay, and the last thing that, uh, there's tons of reasons, but one of the other important ones is um, social circle game is how you get the hottest girls consistently and here's why. Um, it's less pressure for you and it's less pressure for her, right? In cold approach, it's sniper fire. You get one shot. You swing, you miss, sorry, next, right? In cold approach, I mean, social circle game, you can lock in gains, right? You, you make five inches with her tonight, cool, see you tomorrow. So you can live the fight another day. If you mess up, it's okay. I can live the fight another day. I'll see this girl again, right? Okay, let's cover some mindsets for social circle game. This is key, this is key. These, some of these will seem really basic, but, but, but they're huge, all right? Um, social circle game is not cold approach. It is not cold approach, okay? You've gotta throw away most of the cold approach mindsets. If you guys read the forums, and, and I love that stuff, and it, it does apply for cold approach, I write about it. But taking that like, um, no fear, let's take, you know, I, I, I'm gonna be myself all the time. I'm not saying don't be yourself, but this whole like, you know, blow me or blow me out attitude is very detrimental in your social circle. It will kill your social circle. Okay, so do not treat your social circle like a club. All right? Think of social circle mastery as playing chess, not playing checkers. Cold approach is playing checkers. All right? Um, the other thing is, when you in your social circle, do not push the boundaries as much. So with that being verbally, that being physically. I'm going to show you how, because you're going to be like, wait, but I have this one friend who just terrorizes our social circle, the girls love him for it. You'll see that as your value increases and compliance increases, increases and their comfort level increases, you can get away with murder. You can get away with far more within your social circle later. But while you're building this thing in the early in the interim, you've got to be very delicate. Until your value is at a premium, you've got to, um, you don't want to push boundaries, okay? All right, so uh, some of the key terms for this seminar that we're going to cover um, today that are going to just keep popping up over and over and over. One of the first ones is thin slicing. Thin slicing comes from Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, Blink. And what it basically says is it's rapid cognition. It's your first impression of someone. And from my study of neurobiology and of the brain, the way this works is when you see someone, uh, this is why they say dress for the job. If you want to get a job, you need to dress for that part, right? Because when you see someone in a business suit, your frontal cortex, the, the front part of your brain, reaches back in your midbrain, grabs all the memories it can find of someone wearing a suit and projects those onto the person standing in front of them. Guy with a lip ring, guy with a mohawk, you go back in your brain, you grab every memory you've got of a guy with a mohawk and you project that on him. Is a thin slice overcomable? Of course it is. Because you can say, well, I've got this friend of the mohawk that dates 
a lawyer. I don't give a shit. I'm just saying he had to overcome a lot to get her, most likely. All right? So why would thin slicing be important? It comes into, it comes into play in a lot of areas. It comes into play with uh, the company you keep. Do your friends make up your thin slice? If you hang out with five nerds, what are you? You're a nerd, right? You hang out with five cool guys, what do they do? Thin slice five cool guys, they thin slice that onto you. You can ruin a good thin slice or you can overcome a bad one. But ideally, it's free points. It's free points. Why would you not maximize your thin slice? Do you get that? What else plays in a thin slice? Clothes you wear? Your haircut? Your, do you work out or do you, are you sloppy, right? Um, but you know, the main thing is, just keep in mind that I want to manage my thin slice. I don't want you to, don't, don't beat yourself up over it. However, I'm constantly thinking when I meet someone, like how is, how is this guy, what's, his, what, what's the thin slice of this situation? How is this guy gonna make me look? How am I gonna make him look? So it's not just about you, it's if people are not, if people are not wanting to align with you and not wanting to be friends with you, is it possible that you're projecting a terrible fucking thin slice? Is there some things you need to change um, about yourself that would help you thin slice better, all right? Okay, the second one is RAS. RAS, I first heard about this on a David D'Angelo DVD a long time ago and I started researching it and trying to figure out what it was. Um, RAS is basically, it stands for um, Reticular Activation System. And what it does is you can think of it as like the Google of your mind or you can think of it as, it's basically a filter. And what it does is at any given moment, you've got a thousand stimuluses coming in at once, right? And your mind has to, has to figure out what to hone in on and what to put mute, push mute on everything else, right? Right now, there's sound of the air conditioner, sound of me talking, these guys typing, somebody else breathing, but you focus on my voice. Your RAS does that for you. If you wanted a red sports car, you'd start seeing red sports cars everywhere. Your mind would hone in on that, okay? Now, that's the big picture. It happens on the big, on the big picture when you think, I want to start a business, and you start seeing business magazines everywhere, right? But it happens on the small scale, in that the RAS focuses in on what's e either a chance to um, increase your value or a perceived threat to your value, right? So if a tiger came in here right now, even though you guys paid money for the seminar, your RAS would go to the tiger, right? If um, <clears throat> a supermodel walked in here and said, anybody single? You guys would knock the tables over to go over there. Your RAS would go that way. So our RAS either goes with value or hones in on a perceived threat to your value. Why would that be important? Well, it, this one combines with your thin slicing. Your thin sli a good thin slice can create RAS. RAS is, you can manipulate RAS, it's, it's important, all right? Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the next one is uh, value. <coughs> Skipped one, but uh, value. Basically, this goes back to the old, you know, the beginning of time as far as pickup was concerned. What is value? I still, I still don't have a good definition for it, but basically what we have here is survival value, you know, this all adds in, back into your thin slice, survival value, money, power, your friends, your house, your relationships, all that kind of stuff. Then there's repl replication value. So um, for girls, it'd be tits and ass, right? For guys, it would be you work out, and you would, basically you'd make me pretty babies, right? Um, <clears throat> but what, what, what I think is the, you know, Mr. M and I have talked about this a lot, what's probably the most powerful value, which seems basic, is good emotions. Good emotions, right? People are always like, you gotta be higher value, you gotta be this, you gotta be that, don't supplicate. Ah, okay, yeah, whatever. But the truth is, you can not supplicate to me all day long, but if you give me bad emotions, you can still fuck off, right? Or you can be the most high value guy in the world, but if you give me bad emotions, I don't give a shit how rich or cool you are. Do you get that? So good emotions overrides almost everything. Um, then the other one we have is anything that someone has conscious repetitive thought on, or RAS, conscious repetitive thought. Um, so if you're an internet marketing guy, and you sit next to a guy on a plane that's uh, the best internet marketer in the world, you'll instantly have RAS for this guy. But you could sit next to a guy that's a real estate mogul and not give a shit. Does that make sense? So anything you have constant repetitive thought on, how does that play out into social circle mastery? Well, if um, I'm trying to align with someone and I know they have conscious repetitive thought about X, right? For example, we needed this seminar room. We needed this seminar room, right? And one of the guys in here had access to this thing. Well, for a good way to give, you know, Mr. M has conscious repetitive thought on needing a seminar room. So when someone had access to a seminar room, he goes, he pops up on Mr. M's radar. Do you get that? Okay. Um, so the next one is, th these are really key, are the connectors. The connectors. This right here, if you just, it's so basic, but if you just mastered 
these relationships right here, your social circle would explode, your inner game would clean up dramatically, and you would start dating tons and tons of girls without even doing all the other awesome shit in the seminar. Okay, uh, the first one, let me, let me explain it like this. In Tipping Point, another book by Malcolm Gladwell, he says that any social circle is glued together, like a 40-person social circle, not counting family, is glued together by usually one or two people. So everybody else, can you think about that right now? Do you have a friend where you're like, you know, I may be best friends with Kevin, but I met Kevin through Mr. M, and Mr. M introduced me to Versetti, and Mr. M introduced me to 5.0, and Mr. M introduced me to Sheriff, so technically, Mr. M would be the connector in that situation. Does that make sense? So these people are, they're so powerful because they can add sheer numbers to your social life, or they can add, they can make your life easier. Does that make sense? So the first one we have is a social connector. A social connector. Obviously, what does this person add to your life? People, right? These people add people to your life. So what fuels this monster of social circle mastery is people. So the first ones you need to be looking for are social connectors. Can anybody right now, you should write down a couple of these if you've got them. Who do you know right now, guy or girl, that just knows fucking everybody? You have a friend like that? You're like, that guy is constantly on his phone, constantly on Facebook, constantly texting, knows everybody everywhere we go. That is a social connector, and those people are powerful, right? Um, the thing with social connectors, we'll get into this a little bit later, but um, there's, there's specific rules to each one of these different types of connectors. Social connectors are usually flaky, they're kind of ADD, they're all over the place. So it's like um, trying to catch you know, lightning in a bottle sometimes. And a lot of guys, when they're first starting this, this out, uh, what do they say, uh, people respond emotionally to value or a perceived threat to their value, right? So if you respond emotionally to value, you're like, oh, this social connector, he knows everybody, he can get me into places. So they just go nuts, and they're like, hey man, can we hang out, can we hang out, can I see you? Can I call you, what's your number, what are you doing tonight? Can I come, can I come, can I come? And they scare these guys off. Does that make sense? So the main thing I want you to worry about for social connectors right now is if you added two or one or two of these people to your social life, your life would explode, right? Um, the best social connectors, what do you think, guys or girls? Yeah. Girls, obviously, right? What do guys know? More what? They know more guys. Guys know more guys, and any girls they do know, they're already trying to date or sleep with. So I have some awesome social connector guys, and they are powerful too. I don't want to say don't, don't look for them. Um, it's easier to align with, with social connector guys, but look for social, social connector girls. They can be the gatekeeper to massive pockets of, of, of women, right? Okay, the second one is uh, value connectors. Value connectors. Um, a value connector, let me, let me back up. Something I want to add to social connectors is what repels them. There's a couple things I have that just pushes these people away. People that are high maintenance. So you he takes you to a party and you're in his hip pocket the whole night. You're in his hip pocket all night long. Uh, he doesn't call you back because he's ADD as shit and he's all over the map. And you're like, why didn't you call me back, man? What's, what's that all about? That's messed up. Uh, people, people who don't offer win-wins. So he constantly gets you into places, takes you places, does things for you, and you don't do anything back, right? Uh, the next one is drama. Social connectors, their juice in life is their social circle and their people and, and their status, right? So if, you, if they bring you into their social circle and you cause a bunch of drama or give people bad emotions, or give him a bad thin slice, basically, you're done. He's, he won't even tell you. He'll just stop answering his phone. Obviously, bad emotions. Um, being impatient or pushy to hang out, right? Okay, uh, the next one, value connector. A value connector, uh, once again, could be a guy or a girl. What distinguishes these people is there's two different types of value connectors. One is uh, a value connector who could give you access to scarce resources. So they could get you in a club. They can take you on, invite you to cool trips and take you places and get you into concerts and movie premieres and backstage passes to stuff, right? They just genuinely make your life easier. They may not be a good thin slice to have with you, but knowing them makes your life easier. They may be an asshole, but knowing them makes your life easier, right? Um, then you've got the value connector who is a DHV just in and of themselves. Them just standing next to you makes you cooler. Do you get that? So you got a cool guy friend, maybe he's a celebrity, maybe he's just great with women, maybe he uh, is just a really funny guy, maybe he's really good looking, all right? Um, or a really hot girl and really hot girl buddies, right? You walking in a club with five hot girls, 
obviously makes you look a lot better. So there's two types of value connectors, right? Okay, good. Um, to get in with value connectors, it's very hard because they don't need you. These people, a lot of people are like, those people are assholes or they're arrogant or they're, or they're a jerk. That's not really true. They're just established, right? They don't need, unless you can bring them, and they don't even think this on a conscious level. They're not like, what can he bring me? They just feel it. People always want something from them or people have an agenda when they try to give them something. So they're just like, ugh, back off, right? So most value connectors, the best way to meet them is not to walk right up and be like, hey, can we hang out? The best way to meet them is through someone else, a one-off friend of his. Start hanging out with that friend. That'll get you time and shared experiences with that value connector, and a relationship will blossom out of that. Does that make sense? Going right at the value connector oftentimes is the worst way, unless you have something just epic to offer the guy or girl. Then the uh, next one is the ultimate connector. This is ideal for me. I, it, it's, there is no better or worse. You may just want to be a value connector. A lot of my, once you get established in your social circle, it's a lot easier to be a value connector and surround yourself with social connectors. Do you get that? Because it's a lot less work. Being a social connector is a pain in the ass. It's a full-time job. Being a value connector is easy because you can just distribute some value and let, them, let, the, let the army do the work for you. you um, the, but, the, but the next one is, the, like I said, the ultimate connector is the combination of both. He's both a value connector and he's a social connector. Does that make sense? All right, the next one is a situational connector. And this one is huge. It's crucially important, the situational connector. What, what I want to make it clear, social, in Social Circle Mastery, you do not need to make 560 best friends. Do you get that? And I'll explain that better later. I don't have time to be friends with everybody on the planet. A lot of people are acquaintances to me. And I consider them a friend. If I could help them, I'd do it. I wouldn't go out of my way to do it. But I would help them if I could, if it was easy. Do you get that? Those, those ties right there are your strongest ones, though. Your loose affiliations are your strongest ones. You've mined most of the gold out of the five people closest to you. Do you get that? You've mined the gold out of the five people closest to you. So your loose affiliations are going to keep feeding the monster. Going to keep feeding the monster. So the difference is this. With uh, I'll get this in a minute, but... Um, I'll just wait until we get to that. But basically, situational connectors, think of it like... Um, Ugly girls are usually the, the primary gatekeepers, right? It's anybody that has a stable of girls around them that you don't necessarily want to make pull into your top five or one of your best, you know, right close to you, but you do want to be acquaintance with them because it gives you access to the other group, to the rest of the group, right? So any girl that has hot friends, married girls, married guys, gay guys are awesome at this, fat girls, ugly girls, and one of the best ones is orbiter guys. The orbiter guy is the guy that's friends with all the girls but isn't dating any of them, right? You be friends with him, and then you come in and steal the show. Um, but it, but what's, what's powerful about uh, situational connectors is they allow you to, they allow you to cold approach, they allow you to essentially come into a situation fresh but with a complimentary intro. If there's, if there's, um, if it takes, let's see. If it takes 10 points to either sleep with the girl or date the girl, right, then coming in through cold approach, you're starting at a zero, and if she doesn't like your thin slice, you're coming in at like a negative two. Everybody felt that before? You're like, damn, if that girl would have met me in my social circle, she would have loved me. But she didn't, so you're fucked, right? Um, but coming in through uh, a situational connector, just that just all she did was say, hi, this is my friend Nick. Even if she barely knows you, and that's all she knows about you is just your name, you still come in at plus two. You feel that? It's so powerful. This, this right here will get you laid more than anything in, in any of the other connectors. OK, um, one of the ways you can do gatekeeper game, gatekeeper game, meeting these gatekeepers, is there's, there's a couple things. Um, so basically, let's say it's a, it's a, a fat girl that we don't really uh, want to date, but she's a cool chick, all right? Most of these girls are easy to talk to because nobody talks to them. They're usually funny. They've actually developed the personality, right? And what you can do is when you approach or talk to this, these girls, instead of walking up to these five hot girls and cold approaching and it's either a home run or a strikeout, I can pick off the gatekeeper, ask her a very functional question. Hey, do you know what the bathroom is? Hey, do you know what time this place gets good? And then when she's like, oh, it's 10.30, I'm like, oh, cool. Hey, you look really familiar. Did you go to um, University of Oklahoma? 
No, I didn't. Oh, okay, cool. What's your name? And I just go right into rapport building. Rapport, rapport, rapport. And I'm going to tease her and build a little bit of attraction, but I'm not going to build enough to make her like me. Do you get that? I'm not going to make her like me. Then there's two key things you're going to do that most guys never do. Old group theory was open her, get her jazzed up enough to kick her to the curb and talk to her friends, right? Well, what we're playing, we're letting go of the brass ring to grab the gold in the seminar. So I don't, I'm not even going to try to get to her friends tonight. All I'm going to do, get to know her, get her, it's, you know, have fun, show genuine interest in getting to know her. Nobody does that. She's got five hot friends. Everybody just games the shit out of her friends, ignores her. Show genuine interest in getting to know her. And then I'm going to try to bring her value of some kind. And usually it's bullshit value. Usually it's uh, what me and Mr. M call uh, like Christmas. It's like Christmas. It's the thought that counts. A lot of it never actually materializes. Okay? And they don't care. It still feels good. Um, so I might say something like, you know what? You were really cool. You, were, you, um, you remind me of my best friend Sarah from high school. Why would I do that? Kind of disqualify myself as us dating. I'm saying, I'm kind of putting her in friend mode. Then I'll say something like, you know, we keep talking for a while. And I'll be like, you know what? My friend Jason, he, he hardly ever gets to come out with us tonight because he's a doctor and he's really busy. But um, you've got to meet him. I think you guys would really hit it off. He's a cool dude. And you're like the girl version of him. It's weird. What, did, what just happened? Two powerful things just happened. I brought her value so that if I go for her friends, she's not going to be like, oh, that fucker used me. And maybe there is a Jason. Maybe you have a friend you hook her up with. If I can ruin it, it's not just always some sneaky, sly thing. If I can hook her up someday, I will. It's not a, she's probably a cool girl, right? Then um, the other thing that happened is I disqualified myself as a potential dating partner, which is huge. She will now hand her friends off on a silver platter to me. Another powerful thing happened is that I can, now that, now that we're friends instead of me chasing her, there is no like power game anymore. Do you get that? There is no, I text her too much, I called her too much. There is none of that. Because she, we're friends. You can't overcall your friend. He can get annoyed, but he's not going to be like, oh, I'm unattracted. Do you get that? So now I can mysteriously just keep popping up in all these places with her and her hot five friends are and slowly get to know her friends over time through her as opposed to walking over here, sniper, trying sniper fire on the five hot girls and either probably you get blown out, but let's say maybe it kind of hooks. Now you got this shaky ass phone number and then you text it three times they don't text you back you try to call her she doesn't call you back and it just kind of fades away right with this i can slowly um hang out with her hang out with her hang out with her get to know them as much as they want to or not does that make sense and over 10 encounters will they'll get to know me okay the other thing with these gatekeepers don't escalate physically if you go sexual or you go physical and you don't disqualify, you now have a recipe for attraction and she's gonna like you and then she's gonna body block you from all of her friends, okay? Um, with Orbiter Guy, you basically, what do you, talk to, what do you talk to guys about? Pussy, beer, sports. That's it, right? How do you get to know a new guy? Pussy, beer, sports. That's it. I'm gonna find a commonality I can connect with him on and then invite him to something. You're a pretty cool guy, man. We're actually having a party next Friday, you should come. I think we're all going out tomorrow night. You should come. I'm going to invite this orbiter out, get to know him a little bit. He's pretty, usually they're cool guys too. And then he, I'm going to get, gain access to all his friends. Right? Okay, the next one is um, social dead end. Social dead end. A social dead end, um, we have two, two types of these um, for this seminar. Mr. M and I talked about this a lot, and we're like, okay, what is a social dead end? You know, in cold approach game, it doesn't matter as much, but in social circle, it does, especially during the building phase. Once you're established, these people aren't so dangerous or so, like, cancerous, right? But early on, they are. A social dead end, there's two types. The first one is a guy that's got really bad inner game and really bad outer game and really bad social skills. This is your guy that runs around uh, just trying like the basic community stuff all the time. He can't ever just relax and vibe and hang out and get to know people. He's got to be gaming all the time. And he's not only gaming all the time, he's bad at it, right? So he can tear down your social circle real quick and make you look like a dumbass. Anybody have a friend like this? You shouldn't anymore, right? Okay, it's not that you're going to cut these people out of your life. I don't want this to be the seminar where you're like, God, he's dark. He cuts these people if they don't have value and adds them if they do. It's not like that. Anybody that gives me good emotions is welcome in my, on my team. Right? But think of your dating life, think of your life in general as uh, Brian Tracy used to say, be the CEO of your own life. Be the CEO of your own life, right? 
So if you're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, are you gonna, are you gonna hire an internet marketer just because he's nice, but he doesn't know internet marketing? Fuck no, right? So in your dating life, you're not gonna hire guys that know game. Get that out of your head, fuck that. I'll take three naturals over dudes that know game all day long, all day long, okay? But what I am saying is, you are going to hire and fire people for your social circle, for your going out and meeting people's social circle, very specifically, right? You're gonna be a hardcore ax slinging boss with that stuff. If, they, if you got a friend that's this guy and you love him to death though, he gives you good emotions, go have a beer with him. Go to a, uh, what is a soccer, go to a soccer game with him, all right? Is everybody with me? Do not take him into your social circle that you're trying to cultivate. This is important because the way you build a social circle is gonna be a roadmap for the rest of your life. So build well, right? Um, the other problem with these guys is their bad inner game often leaks onto you. Have you ever been around somebody that's all fucked up inside and you're like, God, that just makes me fucked up being around them. So with those people, get them out of your life. Don't spend major time with minor people. Don't know Roosevelt, right? Um, the other one, the other even worse kind of guy is the guy that's got good game, he's really cool, he's a pretty valuable guy in your social circle, but he's what we call an RAS and value thief. He always cuts your legs out to try to impress girls. Do you get that? He's really cool when it's just you and him. Girls walk in, now the asshole comes out. He's always trying to knock you off a pedestal to make himself look better. Um, I'm going to give you some, some, some stuff later on in the seminar on how to train these guys. Because a lot of these guys are just naturals and they don't know how, they, they, what me and Jim call blood in the water. Hot girl comes in, they're just like, ah! They don't know what they're doing. They don't even know that they're fucking you over. They don't, they're not consciously doing it, right? So you can try to train these guys. If that works, great. If not, they got to go. They got to go. They're ruining your shit. Okay, I love the, the, old, uh, the old saying, sleep with dogs, don't be surprised when you wake up with fleas. So you, you add a bunch of these guys, don't, don't, don't be surprised, you're like, I don't know what's going on, I'm not getting any girls. I don't know what's going on, my social circle is just fucked, this guy's an asshole to me for the last two years. But you have this false sense of loyalty because he's your friend. I mean, he's obviously not too good of a friend if he's fucking you over constantly, right? So um, basically, what me and Mr. M call fade to black. Fade to black, right? So you don't just be like, you are now cut from my social circle. You just slowly answer less and less phone calls and, and less and less emails and, and you stop inviting him out quite as much. And we'll get into how to train these guys later, but that's, it's basically fade to black, okay? The, R, the RAS, the value thief guy, I usually clip him out instantly forever. Now, because once I've got my social circle built, I don't have time to, I don't want to fuck around with anybody. I've got badass guys around me. New guy comes in, doesn't get it, he's gone, right? But the, but the guy that's like the other guy, the nerdy guy that just doesn't get it yet, as long as he gives me good emotions, I'll teach that guy. I'll bring him up. But you've got to be established first. You can't go out with five fixer-uppers and expect to build a dynasty. You've got to have the dynasty built, then fix people up. Do you get that? Okay. Um, quick exercise. Take inventory real quick. Write down the five, five people you spend the most time with. And put next to them value connector, social connector, ultimate connector. Social dead end. If you, if you write this down, you have five value connectors, cool. You have five social connectors, cool. You have five social dead ends, you got some work to do. Right? Yeah. Okay, um, and with that, if you have, what you'll notice is this, once you take inventory of this, is if you have five social connectors in your group, you'll have a bunch of people, but you won't have, you won't be getting into the value, high value situation sometimes. So all you gotta do is change the ratio. You don't cut anybody out, you just add another one. I remember in college, I was a social connector like crazy, but I felt like I was just working like an ugly stripper trying to get us to do something fun every night, right? But then when I added my friend Corey, who was also a social connector, it cut my work workload in half and doubled our social circle. So maybe you've got five values. Value, I, I used to hang out with like four or five value connectors, but they didn't do shit. If we went somewhere, they were a great thin slice, and they added a lot of value to my life, but they socially didn't add any people to my life. So taking, taking, you know, looking, at that, looking at the ratio of your people will help you figure this out.
Okay, phase one. This is phase one now. That's all the terms, they'll keep popping up. Phase one is building your social circle, filling in the forest. Filling in the forest. And the first part of this is how to attract connectors and what we call getting sticky. Getting sticky. Uh, I love the quote, life gives to the givers and takes to the takers. Takes from the takers. Life, life gives to the givers and takes from the takers. What does that mean? Nobody? That's right. If you give value, then you get value. So many guys will, uh, just, just for example of my job, they'll send me a six-page email on how to get their girlfriend back and not one time in there say, hey, Braddock, how you doing, man? How, love, your, love your blog, love, love love systems. It's just like, blah, 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 15-page email on how to get my girlfriend back. I'd appreciate it if you get back to me this by Friday. Thanks. It's like, really? Delete. <laughs> Sweet. Do you get that? So it's not that you have to, you know, start them a, a Fortune 500 company or get them the hottest girl in the world. What I say value was, a lot of times it's good emotions. Good emotions go a long, long way. Um, but there's mainly two strategies for getting sticky. And to define getting sticky, once again, Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, uh, Tipping Point, he says uh, getting sticky is an old advertising term. And they say that for you to recognize like Tylenol or Pepsi or any product, you need to see it five to four to six times before you'll even remember it. Any, any less than that, and you don't even know what it is. All right? So the first process for building a new social circle is getting sticky with somebody, getting sticky with uh, somebody you want to make your friend. Um, and there's two strategies for that. The best one is, getting, is meeting people through introduction. Think back to your life. Most of the people you've met, you met through introduction, or you met because you were sharing an event. Like you guys are in this room right now. That would be this category. You were at the same event, you got to know somebody, you had a, like, you know, a similar activity you were doing, so you start hanging out. Um, the way I met the, most of these guys, most of the other instructors, was through Mr. M, right? Because I knew him, because he said the good things about me, um, because we started hanging out more and more, the more these guys were around, and the more relationships started to blossom. I didn't have to walk up to Sheriff and go, hey, could I hang out with you sometime? That'd be awesome. Here's all these five, here's 10 cool things about me, let's trade. That's weird. It doesn't make sense. It makes people uncomfortable. Uh, this is the most natural way to do it. Uh, what you need is numerous hangouts, numerous, no numerous shared experiences. The more intense the shared experience, the better. So guys will come out from, they'll take a boot camp with us, and guys will meet on Friday, and by Sunday they feel like family. It's weird. Anybody taking a boot camp with me, you guys, right? Those guys that were in there with you, it's like you'll, you'll probably know them your whole life. It's like when I played football. Uh, or sports in school, it was by the time you, you share that deep experience together, you feel like you really know each other without even talking about anything specific, right? That's one of the best, best ways. Here's the, here's the formula me and Mr. M have for getting friends. Time, it's pretty basic. Time plus share experience plus a common goal plus good emotions equals friendship. If you are missing any piece of that, then uh, it'll be hard, time, hard to maintain that friendship. For example, me and Dax are really good friends now, but we both do this job together. If I was to switch tomorrow and become an attorney, we wouldn't have a common goal. So I'd still love him to death and we'd still be friends, but it'd be harder for us to find reasons to hang out. Do you get that? So you do need a shared goal, whether that be to go chase pussy together, whether that be to play racquetball together, whether that be to build a business together, whatever that is. You need shared experiences, right? Um, so the second strategy for meeting people is no introduction. This one's tough. This one is really, really tough. Especially the, the more high value they are, the more you need to go with strategy one. The more average person they are, the more you're likely to be able to pull this one off, but it's still tough. Uh, this is basically uh, meeting someone, a random person, and trying to get to know them, right? The thing with that is with the sticky phase with someone you don't know, it may take one time, it may take a hundred times. Same thing with the other one. Just because I hung out with uh, Jim a bunch of times, it probably took me three or four times before I felt comfortable hanging out with Versetti or Dax without anybody being around. Do you get that? Mr. M needed to be there probably the first four, five, six times before I was like, V, you want to go grab lunch? So you get sticky when you get sticky. Sometimes it's one time, sometimes it's a hundred. Do not rush the sticky phase, that's crucial. Uh, but here's some strategies for becoming sticky. Um, 
You've got to have zero agenda, and you don't worry about any one connector. Don't worry about any one. You should be doing this to so many people that you're not sitting there going, all right, my blueprint today for meeting Versetti, here's my next six-month strategy for hanging out with Versetti. No, you should be doing this to so many people, they slowly all just kind of pop back up on your radar. Um, hit and run, mirroring investment level. Hit and run and mirror their investment level. So if I go to talk to, uh, if I just met Sheriff and I wanted to talk to him, and I met him at some club, and I was like, hey man, how's it going, blah, 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 I asked him five questions, and he was like, it's good man, how you doing? Yes, no, cool, blah, blah, blah. Do I wanna just keep pounding him with questions? And just force the relationship? No, no way, right? But if I'm like, hey, how you doing, Sheriff? What's up, man, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I'm great, and he asked me a bunch of questions, and I ask him questions, and we have a long conversation, I'll mirror that investment level. If he's willing to invest, I'm willing to invest. This is during the sticky phase, right? I'm trying to get to know this person. One of the quickest ways to give someone bad emotions is to force a relationship. All right, another thing is be interested 70%, interesting 30% during the sticky phase. What does that mean? Interested, interested in them, 70%, interesting, 30%. What does that mean? Exactly. A lot of guys come up and they're like, listen, man, I've read every pickup book of all time. I've watched the David D'Angelo 50 times and I know every routine by memory. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Do you get that? But they think that that would interest me, so they talk about it 500 times. I don't care. I just don't care. Does that make sense? But if they were like, hey, I really enjoyed your seminar. Um, what, what do, this is egotistical, but what do people like to talk about? Self. Everybody's favorite word is their name. Okay? So the more you talk about yourself, the more they fade to black on you. The more like this guy's an agenda, or he's really insecure, he's trying to impress me. It's annoying, right? However, the 30% is key, because if you're just this question asking like kiss ass, that's weird too. So 30% is where you DHV yourself, what Mr. M calls reward and relate. So you're like, oh, so you are into, you used to work at Link Letters. That's cool. I used to work at whatever, some other law firm, right? Um, oh, you're into soccer. Cool, I'm into soccer. Who's your team? Do you get that? Reward and relate. Reward and relate. Um, the next one, bring value if you can. Bring value if you can. The, far, the closer inside that you want them in your circle, the closer to you you want them, the more real the value must be. The farther on the circle you want to keep them, or the farther out on the periphery they are, the more it can be Christmas value. It's a thought that counts, or none at all. It's just good emotions. With most acquaintances I have, it's literally just good emotions. I don't have any value to bring them, and I don't, have to, I don't care to. Right? Things you must avoid, having an agenda. You can smell an agenda a mile away. So if you think you're gonna come up and Dale Carnegie somebody and how to win friends and influence them, they smell it, they know what's going on whether they tell you or not. So having no agenda other than, I'm gonna, I wanna get to know that guy. I'd like to be friends with him. That's a, that's a good agenda. Or having your agenda up front. If you have some high value that you can bring someone, you're like, hey man, listen, I would love to give, I've got this thing to offer you. I, if I could trade that for this, people like that. That's cool. But having some weird agenda creeps people out. They know what's going on. Uh, also, playing weird power and value games. A lot of the community guys I meet play this weird fucking games with me where you're like, hey man, can you hand me that bottle of water? And they're like, I'm not gonna supplicate to you. <laughs> you're like, wow, okay. I guess I just, I just wanted you to hand me the water, but whatever, right? They're always worried about alpha and beta and all this weird stuff. That stuff is important in that you need to get your subcommunications under wrap, but people know when you're trying to play stupid power games with them. The more you can learn to vibe and give good emotions without letting people cross your boundaries, the more you'll connect and connect and connect and connect, right? Um, bragging, we talked about that. Kissing ass. A kiss ass is just as bad as a dude that tries that sound cool. So that basically that's being nice. Being, the, the way I see a kissing ass is kindness with an agenda. If you truly mean it, it's kindness. If you're like, I hope if I say this to him, it makes him <coughs> react a certain way. That's kindness with an agenda. That's kissing ass. And then trying to force the relationship. Okay. This is the structure of relationships. All 
All right, this is, uh, think of this like a concentric circle, like the rings on a tree, okay? This would be like your inner, inner, inner core. This would be like two of your best friend, you and your best, best buddy, or your wife, your girlfriend. Second one would be your top five, what we call the Navy SEAL team, right? It's our Navy SEAL team. Your five best buddies, guys or girls. People that you would give a briefcase of a million dollars into it and need to trust them with it. The third ring is like your, your top 15. People you call and keep up with and you care about, but they're not necessarily know your deepest, darkest secrets. Okay? Um, and the fourth ring is what we call, so the, the, the third ring would be like your family, not your literally your family, like your social family, I guess. Um, and your fourth ring would be like the community. This would be, so this would be like, you know, two people, five people, 15 to 20 people, this would be like 20 to a million, okay? So, once again, when you're trying to think, how do I get value and this and that and the other, the first two rings, value's gotta be real. The closer in to the core, the more real the value's gotta be. The farther out, the more it can be um, the thought that counts, right? Cores one and two, these determine the quality of women you will get, the quality. Cores one and two, Rings one and two determine the quality of women you will get. Someone explain that to me. Why would they determine the quality of women you get? Exactly, because they're your thin slice. These are the people I spend the most time with, so they're my thin slice, right? They'll also they'll, these two rings will also determine your overall success with women and life in general. Where they say you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with, or your income is the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. It applies around the board. Now the third and fourth rings determine the quantity of women you get. You get that? So rings one and two determine the quality of women. I'm, I, if I surround myself with high value guys that are in high value circles and high value girls that are in high value social circles, I'm gonna be pulled into those circles and keep meeting more of them, right? And me being associated with that is gonna pull me up and make me a high value guy, make my thin slice good. The third and fourth ring, on the other hand, add quality, or add quantity to your social life. You get that? Everybody with me? So three and four add quantity. The good thing about, what I love about this is all we need here is to have good emotions and Christmas value, the thought that counts down here, all right? So the next thing would be, what I'll talk to you guys about is your social forest. The way you can see your social life is what me and Mr. M call trees, social trees. Okay? And the way to look at this is the guys at the top or the guys and girls at the top are the power brokers and then it's everyone else. Do you get that? So the tr that's why we drew it like trees. And it gets bigger being more people. Each one of these trees is a different size as well, right? So if you have a yoga class tree, it's probably a little small tree, not a big deal to you. This might be, uh, this might be your work tree. This might be um, my social life, my, my big social circle. This might be um, the, a tree I share with Sheriff that I don't know everybody in it, but I am pulled into it because I know him, right? So the, it's, a, then it's a sum total of all, the, all your trees, of all your people. That's your social circles, right? Um, now, what you need to do you need to be at the top of at least one tree. Not the top, like, here's where the weird community stuff's gotta go. Like, it doesn't mean you are this guy sitting at the top. I bully everybody and I'm the alpha. That's nerd shit, get rid of that, okay? What, what it means is, I'm like this. I'm one of these guys. I'm one of these guys. I share the power with five badass motherfuckers. Everybody with me? You get that? So, um, but what happens is you've got to be okay with coming into trees at different places. So if when I came to London and met all these guys, I already knew Sheriff and I already knew Mr. M. And they were high value in their social circle. Do you get that? So when I came into their social circle and their club promotions thing, I got lucky enough to enter somewhere up here with them. Now I can mess that up or I can climb within that. Do you, does that make sense? But let's say, um, I meet some of Mr. M's work friends I didn't spend much time with. And that tree, he hardly ever hangs out with them. They consider him down here because he doesn't even, he doesn't even hang out. Where did I come in? So I meet them through Mr. M. 
What do I come in? Same place. Do you get that? Now within that I can climb or, or, or fall, but I, come, I enter where he, uh, where he enters. Can you now see the seminar coming together where if you have a bunch of social, high value social connectors and high value value connectors, you get to enter higher and higher more often. Does that make sense? But be okay with anything, especially when you're building this thing, come in wherever the fuck you can come in. It doesn't matter. Don't be like, oh, he's not high value enough, I can't come in. That's stupid. Just, just get in there wherever you can. You need, to, you need people for this monster to eat, okay? Um, but realize the closer you are to the top, the closer you are to the top, the more RAS you will get from women. Does that make sense? Why do natural, I remember when I was like, I, I used to get laid all the fucking time. I never, I never knew one routine or had any stupid DHV stories. What the fuck is going on there? How did I do that? Was I just Mr. Hero conversationalist? No. I was good at this. I was good at coming into trees and aligning with the top five, top five guys. They already had RAS from all the girls and I got it too. Does that make sense? 